car you drive, you're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Oh come on, as if I wasn't gonna recommend this one. Put simply, Fight Club is one of the defining movies of the late 1990s, a film that perfectly captured the angst, frustration and resentment of an entire generation of young men raised on divorce and disappointment, cast adrift at the tail end of a pretty mediocre decade and enslaved to a world of soulless corporations and shallow consumerism. Oh yeah, and it's also a tight, smart, intense and darkly funny psychological thriller starring two actors at the peak of their careers. So for that reason, I'm about to break the first rule of Fight Club and talk the shit out of it. It's time for another DRINKER RECOMMENDS! The movie begins with a flash forward to the climax of the story where the protagonist is being held at gunpoint by an unseen man named Tyler Durden. We never get his name in the actual movie, but for the sake of convenience, let's just call him Jack. Jack explains that the high-rise office buildings around them have all been rigged with demolition charges that are due to go off in a matter of seconds. Well, that's not very good. But what the fuck is this all about? What's the purpose of this attack? Who is Tyler Durden, and why did he take Jack hostage? And how does a woman named Marla Singer fit into it? Well, let's find out, shall we? Flashback a few months and Jack's an insurance specialist for a car manufacturer. Which one, you might ask? A major one. He's wealthy and successful, but bored and unsatisfied by his shallow, materialistic existence. This lack of purpose and fulfilment results in chronic insomnia, and a desperate visit to his doctor eventually leads him to a support group for cancer survivors. Clearly he doesn't belong here, but he finds a kind of weird emotional release that allows him to sleep soundly for the first time in years. Before he knows it, he's a regular at all kinds of support groups, faking his way in so he can leech off people's misery and make himself feel better. What a guy. This is all great, until a woman named Marla Singer starts showing up. Straight away, Jack realises that she's a misery tourist like himself, and that realisation bursts his bubble, causing his insomnia to return. That's when he happens to cross paths with a mysterious salesman named Tyler Durden. Tyler is everything that Jack isn't. He's laid back, charismatic, good looking and confident, and he's able to instantly cut through the bullshit of everyday life. When Jack returns home to find his apartment destroyed by a gas explosion, he remembers Tyler's number and reluctantly meets up with him for a few beers. That's when something weird happens. Tyler suddenly asks Jack to hit him, leading to a clumsy brawl in the parking lot outside. But instead of driving them apart, the confrontation actually solidifies their friendship, leading Jack to conclude that... We should do this again sometime. Pretty soon, he's moved into Tyler's dilapidated house, and the two of them are having regular fistfights in parking lots and back alleys. It's not long before other like-minded men get drawn to their violent contests, and before they know it, they've formed their own underground fight club, where men from all walks of life find release from the pressures and frustrations of the modern world with a bit of good old-fashioned fisticuffs. As time passes, Jack finds himself identifying more and more with Tyler's simple, brutal worldview. He quits his job after extorting his boss for money in one of the most ballsy plays I've ever seen. <laughs> and rejects the corporate world he used to be part of, giving himself up to the emotional and physical highs of Fight Club. It's become like a drug for him, and like any good addict, all he really cares about is his next hit. But things take a darker turn when Tyler hooks up with Marla, driving a wedge between the two friends. Even worse, he begins to transform Fight Club from a simple pastime into an organised terrorist network called Project Mayhem, with Tyler firmly at the top. It starts out with minor acts of vandalism, but soon escalates into major attacks, blackmail and intimidation as the group's power and influence grows. Matters come to a head when one of the group gets shot and killed, and Jack realises that Project Mayhem needs to be stopped. The problem is that the network has now grown beyond his control, and no matter how hard he tries, Tyler always seems to be one step ahead of him. How exactly does he manage this? Well... Because we're the same person. That's right. What I really love about this revelation are the hints subtly woven throughout the narrative in a way that's possible to gloss over if you don't know what's coming, but also make complete sense on repeated viewings. In fact, it actually puts a fascinating new spin on certain conversations once you understand the full context behind them. Except for their humping, Tyler and Marla were never in the same room. 
My parents pulled this exact same act for years. He's not here. What? Yeah, not that we don't love your little visit. You know, you are such a nutcase. I can't even begin to keep up. My dad never went to college. So it's real important that I go. That sounds familiar. Jesus Christ, I really miss films like this. Anyway, the action culminates right where it began, at the top of a high-rise with a ticking bomb and Tyler holding Jack at gunpoint. Except, well, he isn't. And once Jack realises this, once he comes to terms with who and what he's created, he's finally able to destroy it. Just in time to watch Tyler's plan come to fruition. You met me at a very strange time in my life. Fight Club wasn't a big success at theatres when it released 20 years ago. It was too dark, too confusing, too subversive for mainstream audiences. But it grew in popularity over the years on home video, ironically becoming a kind of underground cult phenomenon, just like its namesake. And for good reason, it's quite simply a brilliant film. On the one hand, it's a smart, twisted psychological thriller with black comedy elements that manages to present its story in a witty, subversive style and pull the rug out from under you in a way that feels satisfying and earned. I love the subtle details they worked into the production, like how Jack and Tyler's appearance gradually changes over the course of the movie. Ed Norton went on a crash diet to become increasingly emaciated, while Brad Pitt trained and lifted weights every day. As a result, Jack gets progressively weaker and more fucked up as he loses control of his own mind, while Tyler looks bigger and stronger as he slowly takes over. On that subject, Tyler Durden may be one of the most compelling and fascinating characters I've seen in years. A smart, capable highly motivated man that rejects the fakery of modern society, who can easily sway others to his cause, and who absolutely doesn't give a shit what people think of him. As he himself admits, he's free in every way that Jack isn't. He represents what every button-down office worker toiling away in some soulless cubicle wishes he could be. What's interesting though is that Tyler does have a kind of loose moral code that he adheres to. He'll happily destroy property and intimidate others to achieve his aims, but he won't harm innocent people if he can avoid it. There's even a suggestion that he might ultimately have good intentions behind his destructive acts. Like when he threatens a convenience store employee into improving his life. If you're not on your way to becoming a veterinarian in six weeks, you will be dead. <laughs> Tomorrow will be the most beautiful day of Ray McHale's life. His breakfast will taste better than any meal you and I have ever tasted. Or make sure to evacuate the buildings that they plan to destroy to avoid civilian casualties. That being said, the humour in this film is as black as they come, like Jack and Tyler rendering human fat to make high quality soap to sell to rich clients, or a woman with terminal cancer who just wants to get laid and uses the support group to proposition anyone willing to sleep with her, or pissing into the soup served in expensive restaurants, or sneaking a flash frame from a porn movie into a kids movie just for shits and giggles. <laughs> It's a great combination of juvenile anarchy and dark comedy that makes for a compelling watch, because you never quite know what the movie's gonna throw at you next. But the real reason Fight Club made such an impact is because it dared to make some pretty astute observations about modern culture, and particularly men's place in it. The characters in this movie are basically what happens when Generation X has to grow up and venture out into the real world. A world of bland offices, pointless meetings, generic apartments and unfulfilling lives, where men are conditioned to be sensitive, docile and compliant. This was also the first generation to grow up with divorce and single parents as the norm. As Tyler himself remarks, We're a generation of men raised by women. The result of all this is a kind of lost generation of bored, confused, emasculated corporate drones with no real drive or purpose. So instead, they obsess over trivial workplace presentations or which bland IKEA cushions would go with their bland IKEA curtains. Whereas previous generations had fought wars or reached for the stars, this one was cast adrift in an ocean of corporate mediocrity. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. Fight Club posits the idea that maybe aggression, competition and the rush of physical danger are fundamental parts of the male psyche, and if you remove them, then all you end up with is a bunch of weak, useless, effeminate pussies sitting around crying about how hard their lives are. It's no coincidence that Jack finds solace in a testicular cancer survivors group. He's literally surrounded by emasculated men, lamenting the loss of their identity. 
It also explains why Fight Club quickly attracts legions of lost, disenfranchised young men desperately looking for meaning and purpose. But the movie also makes some pretty telling observations about how easily those people can be manipulated by strong, charismatic leaders as Tyler gradually transforms Fight Club into Project Mayhem, channeling his followers' anger and aggression behind a singular objective. The way they shave their heads, change into standard clothes and obey orders without hesitation, willingly surrendering their individuality for the cause. It's a cult, basically. Pay particular attention to the scene where Bob gets killed during a mission and Tyler followers quickly adapt their beliefs to keep them consistent. In death, a member of Project Mayhem has a name. Just like how cult members will go through the most insane mental gymnastics to rationalise all the contradictory bullshit they get fed. The funny thing about Fight Club is that people see it as an anti-capitalist movie, which I guess fits into the 2020 narrative, but the truth is that it's much more fundamental than that. Fight Club is about rebelling against the empty, meaningless nature of society in general. It's a stinging rebuke against materialism, corporate culture, and the pursuit of shallow, fleeting enjoyment, rather than taking the harder, more painful path to deeper meaning and fulfilment. In short, it's a warning against denying human nature. And with Jack's final acceptance and defeat of Tyler, the film may be suggesting that the way forward is to strike a kind of balance between these two extremes. The problem with films that so perfectly capture the mood and culture of their time is that they obviously tend to come across as dated and quaint when you rewatch them years later. But the scary thing is that the message and warnings of Fight Club are even more relevant now than they were 20 years ago. You only have to take a casual look at random social media threads or the bland, sanitised garbage that passes for modern entertainment to see exactly what I'm talking about. And you can't help but wonder, what if Tyler was right after all? Now this is where I'd normally tell you to go away, but just before I sign off, I wanted to do my own little bit for capitalism. Most of my regular viewers probably know that I write books when I'm not tearing apart shitty movies, and as it happens, my latest one is about to get published. Something to Die For is the concluding novel in the Ryan Drake action thriller series, and well, I'm actually kinda proud of it. If you've ever wanted to support this channel, or just take a chance on a new author, then you could probably do a lot worse than this. If so, I'd certainly appreciate the support, but either way, I'll drop a link in the description and let you make your own decision. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.